Hello again, this is Sean with VRP Catholic Media, and today we're covering a few saints from the month of October. And just an overview, we're going to look at St. Edward the Confessor, uh, last Anglo-Saxon... Uh, here we go. Okay, let's try that. <laughs> Hello again. This is Sean with BRP Catholic Media. And today we're going to be looking at a few saints from the month of October. Now, before we begin, um, just to cover a few things. Um, I just wrapped up my series on the saints, which I had started on BitChute a little over a year ago, uh, got hung up around the month of April, it took a long time to get the rest of them out. But basically, I have a biography of a saint from every single day of the year, sometimes two, um, but usually just one, um, either from Alvin Butler's Pictorial Lives of the Saints or taken from the 1962 Roman Missal. Um, so pretty much any saint you want to learn a little bit about, you can go to my channel on BitChute, uh, VRP Catholic Media. It might be under Vexia Regis Prodeant uh, Media still, which um, I shortened it to VRP just to be quicker. Um, but that is basically the banners of Christ fly abroad. Um, anyway, so yeah, if you want to find anything about a saint, just look at my BitChute account. Um, some stuff is on YouTube. Some stuff is on Rumble. But I started off on BitChute. I ended up on BitChute. Um, right now, I'm doing a series on the Popes. And that one's primarily going through uh, YouTube. Um, once I get all that uploaded through there, I'll move it over to better platforms. But for now, it's just quicker to do it this way. Um, and I decided to start doing my series on the papacy going backwards instead of forwards, um, which got a little bit of rage from some of the SETI community because they flew off the handle that I even did a video on John Paul II, which is when the book I used, which is called Popes Through the Ages, um, ended, you know, so I'm just reading verbatim what the book says, not putting in my bias one way or the other, just presenting at least a, a somewhat of a historical summary of these figures, which most people don't know anything about. Um, and I learned a lot going through Popes Through the Ages, and I think you will too. It's going to take a long time to get through it. There's, I think, 262 popes or something. Um, so basically not including Benedict to today. Um, uh, so that's going on. Check that out. Um, and then aside from that, the book, um, Christ Kings, um, the subtitle got changed because I put up a poll on Gab and Facebook. And um, the secondary title that I put in as an option for people to vote on actually was more um, appealing. And I kind of agree. So it's uh, Christ Kings, Royal Saints of the Catholic Church. Um, I, so that's what the book title will be. And thanks to all those who have donated already. Um, please um, go to the PayPal link and donate. It goes towards um, getting the holy cards produced for the book and getting all the illustrations and the publishing and all that good stuff to get this book finally out. Um, and like, like and subscribe so that way you can stay up to date with the content and know when that stuff is going to come out. Um, anyway, so let's go back to the main focus of today, which is going to be a few saints uh, from October. We're going to be looking at uh, one of the last Anglo-Saxon kings, St. Edward the Confessor, and we'll also look at another uh, royal saint, St. Hedwig of Silesia, who was a duchess, and we're going to be looking at St. Remigius, who himself wasn't um, royalty, really. I think he was from noble <coughs> parents, um, However, um, he was the one who baptized Clovis, king of the Franks. And then finally, we'll be looking at the Feast of Christ the King. Um, and I'll be reading from uh, the bull of Pope Pius IX, um, Quas Primus. Um, and that is really the declaration on Christ the King. And it's a uh, response to um, you know, sort of after World War I. Um, anyways, we'll get into that later. I want to look first at St. Remigius. And St. Remigius, his feast day was actually on the 1st of October, and he had an episcopate of over 70 years, which is really quite impressive, especially for the day in which he lived. Um, he was born about 439 to noble Gaulish parents. And at this time, uh, Gaul, Roman Gaul, France, um, was, um, well, under the decline, really the last gasps of the Roman um, Empire. 
Um, and at this time, the Franks and other barbarians were, you know, causing trouble in a lot of the old dominions of uh, the Roman Empire in the West. And um, at this time, the Vandal persecution in France was quite heavy. Um, <clears throat> there was a hermit um, who lived at this time who was named uh, Montanus, and he had lost his sight. And he had a vision of an angel, which actually foretold the birth of Remigius by a certain woman. And um, this man, uh, Remigius, he would go on to deliver uh, the country from persecution. Um, and it was also... Um, anyways. Oh, no, I'm going to have to go all the way back. Okay. All right. A lot of my stuff out of order here. It's a little annoying. That was Pope Pius XI, so I had that wrong too. So I'll start over. What time are we at? All right. So starting over at around 6.30. Hello, this is Sean from VRP Catholic Media. <clears throat> Hello again, this is Sean from VRP Catholic Media. And we're going to be looking today at a few saints from the month of October. And just before we get into things, um, I want to cover... Um, just some recent updates. I began my initially um, on BitChute as Vexia Regis Prodeunt uh, Media, and that is um, the first lines in the hymn, uh, The Banners of Christ Fly Abroad. Um, I've sent, shortened it to VRP Catholic Media just to be more concise and less Latin for people that don't understand it. Um, not that I understand it that well myself. Uh, anyways, um, so I just wrapped up my series that I began on BitChute um, of all the saints through the year. Um, so it doesn't have every single saint, but um, starting from... Uh, all right, I'm going to have to just redo that again. Hello again, this is Sean with VRP Catholic. Today we're going to be looking at a few saints from the month of October. And um, before we get into things, I just want to make an announcement. I started my channel a little over a year ago um, on BitChute, um, and it was initially to put out um, just a series on the saints, every saint of the day. Um, and so finally, after, you know, the first thing I did was really good. All right, so here's what I'm going to do. Keep original part, and I'm going to put in a little bit. Hopefully it doesn't look too goofy. And we're going to go back to where I was with St. Remigius. All right, what's well, before six minutes? Come back in. So they were executing France at this time, and there was a man named Hermit. Uh, there was a hermit named Monatus. Awesome. Where was I? Um, and Remigius also, um, now Remigius had, now the hermit had a vision of an angel, which foretold the birth of a child named Remigius, who would um, go on to deliver the country from persecution. And um, Now, at this time, the Vandals were persecuting France, and there was a hermit named Monatus who lost his sight, but he ended up having... 
Now at this time, the Vandals were persecuting France and uh, there was a hermit named Monatus. At this time, the Vandals were persecuting France. There was a hermit named Montanus and he had lost his sight, uh, but he had a vision of an angel which foretold the birth of a child named Remigius by a certain woman. And this child would go on to live At this time, the Vandals were heavily persecuting France, and there was a hermit named Montanus who had lost his sight. He had a vision of an angel which foretold the birth of a child named Remigius by a certain woman, and this child would go on to deliver the country from persecution. So Remigius went and he visited this woman and told him about this vision, and she was a little bit incredulous, but he told her this is all true, and uh, even um, the milk that you give him to suck will heal my blindness. And in fact, these prophecies of his came to pass. Um, these are recorded in the Golden, Leg uh, the Golden Legend by uh, uh, Jacobus Foragine. Um, at 22, um, okay, let's see, make a little note. Okay, at 11.45, coming back in with a cut. So at this time, the Vandals were heavily persecuting France, and there was a hermit named Montanus who had lost sight. He had a vision of an angel which foretold the birth of a child named Remigius by a certain woman, and this child would go on to deliver the country from the persecution. Uh, Remigius went and he visited this woman and told her about the vision. She was a little bit incredulous, uh, but he would go on to tell her that um, the milk that child uh, would use to suck uh, would... So at this time, the Vandals were heavily persecuting France, and there was a hermit named Montanus who had lost his sight. He had a vision of an angel which foretold the birth of a child named Remigius by a certain woman, and this child would go on to deliver the country from persecution. He, uh, the hermit, went to go see the woman, and he told her about this vision, and he foretold even that the milk that she gave the child to suck would heal his vision if used on his eyes. I can't get through this way. Okay. So at this time, the Vandals were heavily persecuting France, or modern-day France. And uh, there was a hermit named Montanus, and he had lost his sight, but he had a vision of an angel which foretold to him the birth of a child named Remigius by a certain woman, and that this child would go on to deliver the country from the persecution. Now, uh, Montanus, he went and visited the woman and told her about this vision, and she was a little bit incredulous, um, but the child was eventually born and named Remigius. And in fact, the milk that uh, she gave him to suck would actually go and heal the eyes of the hermit, just as he. So at this time, the Vandals were heavily persecuting France, and there was a hermit named Montanus who had lost his sight. He had a vision of an angel, which foretold to him the birth of a child named Remigius, who uh, would be born by a certain woman. Why can't I get through this? Okay, let's check again. Okay, 13, 14. So at this time, the Vandals were heavily persecuting what is modern-day France. And there was a hermit named Montanus who had lost his sight, but he had a vision of an angel which foretold the birth of a child which would be named Remigius, and um, that this child would go on to deliver the country from persecution. Now, uh, Remigius went and visited the certain woman that uh, this vision foretold of, and she was a little bit incredulous, to say the least. Um, in fact, the hermit even told her that uh, the milk she gave the child to suck would heal his sight. But these prophecies did come to pass. At the age of 22, uh, Remigius became the bishop of Reims. There's a legend about him that he had made the sign of the cross over some uh, empty vessels of wine at a woman's house, and they uh, began to almost overflow. Um, so there are a number of parallels um, between sort of other biblical stories, um, at least in the telling of uh, the legend of St. Remigius within the Golden Legend by Jacobus Vorgine. Um, 
uh, eventually there was um, a conversion of really great import, um, and that was done by St. Remigius himself. Uh, Clovis I, who was the king of the Franks, was a pagan, but he was admonished by his Christian wife to pray to God. Uh, there was a great battle, and before this battle, or during it, he promised to be baptized if the Christian God um, gave him success. This did happen, and on Christmas Day, 508, um, St. Remigius baptized Clovis, king of the Franks, and this is sort of the beginning of uh, Catholic France, um, the uh, what, eldest daughter of the church. Um, so, um, another interesting fact about um, the uh, baptism, um, the chrism that was used, there was uh, none actually around, but a dove descended, um, carrying some chrism in um, what is called an apula. And um, this apula was actually housed in the cathedral of uh, St. Remy um, in France um, for quite a long time until the French Revolution, I feel like this is always the story, um, it got destroyed. So today in the Cathedral of Reims, there's actually a replica or I guess more of a successor chalice of St. Remy, the Holy Apula, um, which only contains a fragment of the original um, uh, relic. Um, so really unfortunate, but you know, revolutionaries really messed up the church. All right, so that's pretty much all I wanna talk about with um, St. Remigius and go into another sort of royal saint, uh, St. Hedwig of Silesia. And she was the Duchess of Silesia, which is sort of um, modern day Poland. Um, and a story about her, she had a custom of um, mortification. And uh, one of them was to walk barefoot in the snow and in, in the winter time. And there was her bishop who eventually told her that she needs to wear shoes. And out of obedience, she did wear shoes. However, she wore them on her hands. So she was a woman with a profound sense of um, wanting to uh, mortify her own self for the benefit of other souls. And in fact, um, she wore a hair shirt, but the outside fabric of the shirt was made to look as though she was wearing uh, more regal clothing. start from the top. Hate it. Hello again, this is Sean with VRP Catholic Media, and today we're looking at a few saints of October. Before I begin, I just want to say um, I had initially began my channel on uh, BitChute and started with just uploading the saint of the day, 
And I took this either from the Roman Missal of 1962 or when there wasn't a saint available. Um, I would take it from Alvin Butler's uh, Pictorial Lives of the Saints. So I have a saint for every single day of the year. Um, some of them have doubles. And I have a number of feasts and other things on my channel as well. Um, it's expanded since then. Um, but finally, I had la um, gotten to the point where I uploaded my last saint um, for the month of May. And I began in June. Um, so, it, you know, had a, like a six-month kind of, kind of uh, I don't know what you would call it. Because I screwed it all up again. Hello again, this is Sean with VRP Catholic Media, and today we're going to be looking at a few saints from the month of October. And before we begin, I just want to announce that when I began my channel, uh, I started on BitChute. Uh, I recommend you go over there and look at that. And it started with just me uploading the saint of the day for every day of the year. Um, I would take this from the Roman Missal of 1962, um, and when there wasn't a saint available, I would take it from Alvin Butler's Pictorial Lives of the Saints. So some days have double a couple of saints. Um, I think there's even a couple of cases of three saints on one day. Um, and then there are some days that are feast I talk about, and there are other things on the channel as well. But I finally got to the point where I uploaded the last saint of the last day from when I began. Um, so just about any saint you want to look up, you can go to my channel on BitChute. It should be VRP Catholic Media. You can find me or um, Vexilla Regis Prodeunt, which is what I began the channel as, um, but that's Latin, um, and it's taken from the hymn, um, uh, and it basically says, uh, the banner of Christ flies abroad. Um, but since most people don't speak Latin, and I myself am not really fluent in it, um, I decided to just condense it into VRP, Catholic media, and I think it gets the point across of you know what this channel is all about. Um, I also have content on Rumble, um, I'm on Gab, uh, Facebook, Instagram, which is totally useless. I hate it, but I'm, I have a presence there anyway, so no one can steal my uh, media company's identity, I guess. Um, so yeah, I, go ahead and check that out. I began a new series um, not too long ago, and it's coming out on YouTube. Eventually, I'm going to move it over to another channel, but for right now, it's just easier to use that platform. Um, and it's a series on the popes, and it's all taken from a book. Uh, the Popes Through the Ages. Um, my edition, I think, was edited last in 1980. And um, its final Pope, it talks about, is John Paul II. And instead of going from the you know beginning, from St. Peter to the end, I figured I would go from the end to the beginning. And I find it to be a little more interesting that way. You get a sense of your own history going backwards, which, you know, it keeps you hooked on versus... At least for me, I learned about St. Peter, and it's like, okay, uh, Linus, and you get on through the next popes, and there's really sort of a disconnect, and there's a lot of lot less history or um, historical documents available um, about those eras. So I think this will be the best approach to do it, even though it has sort of got some of the more steady crowd upset for some reason that I even dare to post a video about John Paul II and refer to him as Pope. Um you know, these aren't even my words. This is taken directly from a book with no commentary. So deal with it. Um, so go ahead, check out my series on the popes. There are 262 to something or some odd popes in there. Um, so it's going to take like a whole year to get through all of them, even if I post a pope a day, pretty much. Um, so um, check that out. Um, I also um, have finally chosen the subtitle for the Christ King's book, which is a series and it's going to look at eight different um, Catholic saints who were royalty as well, uh, earthly princes. And um, uh, so I put out a, a, a query, you know, a poll on Gab and on um, Facebook just to kind of feel out. My initial title was Catholic Kings. Uh, uh, oh, you know what? I can't even remember it now. My second option, which I just kind of put off the cuff, was a royal saint of the Catholic Church. And people more favorably responded to that one. So I think I'm going to go with that for sure. And especially as far as search engines are concerned, you know, you, you're hitting all your targets right there. I think people won't have any trouble if they're looking for a royal saint of the Catholic Church. There you go. 
Um, uh, in a junction with that, if you make a donation um, to my PayPal account, I want to thank all those who have donated so far. Uh, if you make a donation of $5 or more, you'll get a copy of a St. Winkesles Holy Card, which uh, I think came out really great. And I've gotten great responses from the people I've mailed it to so far. So if you want that, like, subscribe, donate to our PayPal. It helps to go and put our book out because publishing and illustrations, all that stuff costs money. But I think at the end of the day, it's going to be beneficial for Catholic families and homeschooling families um, and even just any buddy who doesn't know much about the Catholic Church or thinks he does to get a better sense of um, really the virtues of um, charity um, and being a um, Catholic king. Um, so uh, speaking of Catholic kings, today we're going to be looking at the institution of Christ the King, and I'm going to be reading quite heavily from the bull of Pius XI, Quas Primus, which um, is a response to the governments of the time, sort of post-World War I, um, refusing uh, even to acknowledge God in their constitutions and elevating the rights of man above all, which really is elevating the rights of Satan, you know, in your government. Um, so we're going to be looking at that a little bit later, um, and we're going to be looking at St. Edward the Confessor, who was a holy saint, one of the ones who's going to be in the book, and he was one of the last Anglo-Saxon kings, and he is um, going to be looked at in depth. So um, then we're going to be looking at St. Hedwig of Silesia, so I got distracted there, and then finally St. Remigius. So got kind of a holy noble theme. St. Remigius himself came from noble parents, um, but he wasn't really royalty, but he did baptize Clovis, who was the king of the Franks, um, an, an important event in French history. And so we're going to start with St. Remigius. We've got that event portrayed down here. You can see St. Remigius and he is baptizing Clovis, the pagan king of the Franks, no longer a pagan. So his feast day is celebrated on October the 1st. And he had an episcopy of over 70 years, which is quite a long time, especially uh, for the era in which he lived, because he was born in 439. Uh, he was born of noble parents, as I said, and he was born in Gaul. This is Roman Gaul, um, which is modern-day France. Um, however, at this time, the Vandals uh, were really persecuting uh, the French or Gaul, Roman Gaul. And there was a, a hermit named Montanus who had lost his sight, but he had a vision and an angel foretold to him that there was going to be a certain woman who gave birth to a child she would name Remigius and that this child would go on to deliver the country from the persecution. And even foretold that the milk that um, this woman gave Remigius to suck would be used to heal um, this hermit's eyes, his um, sight. And in fact, these prophecies came true. He went and spoke to this woman and she was incredulous. But again, his, height, his sight was healed. And of course, Remigius was born and he would go on to really help liberate um, the persecution of the French. Um, I say that uh, not historically completely accurate um, because the um, Franks sort of really melded pretty well with what was left of the disintegrating Roman Empire at the time. Um, at the age of 22, he became the Bishop of Reims, and there is a legend about him that he went to a woman's house, and uh, she had some vessels of wine that were just about empty, uh, but he made the sign of the cross over them, and they began to overflow. Um, and this legend, of course, really parallels with the gospel, um, and it's taken from the Golden Legend by Jacobus Voragine. Um, so Clovis I was the king of the Franks. And he was a pagan, but he was married to a Christian woman. And he was admonished by his wife to pray to God. Um, Clovis would fight this great battle. And um, in the midst of this battle, he would pray to the Christian God. And he promised to be baptized if he found success. He did find success. He won the battle. And on Christmas Day, 508, after even more prodding by his wife, um, he was finally baptized by St. Remigius. And when this happened, um, there was actually no chrism. However, a dove descended from the sky carrying uh, the holy apula, as it's called. Um, and this chrism was used to baptize Clovis, the first French king. And this would actually um, be a relic and used um, in the coronation of French kings going onward for quite some time. Um, and then we get to the French Revolution, which was uh, a horrible event. Um, many people killed, many 
monks and nuns killed and raped, uh, churches burned, and of course, the Cathedral of Reims, this holy relic, um, the, uh, the Chalice of St. Remy, as it's called, the Holy Apula, was destroyed. A fragment of it still exists as a uh, successor chalice, you could say, um, and it is housed in the uh, uh, cathedral at Reims. Uh, but again, quite unfortunate. So um, that pretty much is what I want to say about St. Remigius. Those are the highlights of his life. And we'll move on to another saint, uh, St. Saint Hedwig of Silesia. And she was a duchess of Silesia, which is sort of Poland uh, nowadays. And um, an interesting story about her and her piety. She really uh, practiced a lot of mortification. Um, she had this custom during winter of walking barefoot in the snow. And eventually her bishop even told her she needs to wear shoes. And out of obedience, she did wear shoes, but she put them on her hands instead. Um, so she really had quite the drive um, for mortifying herself for the benefit of other souls. And this would really um, exemplify her life. In fact, um, she frequently attended mass and she wore a hair shirt. However, the outside fabric of the shirt was made to look as though uh, there was no hair shirt, uh, which is sort of a common thing as well among many saints. Um, St. Thomas of Canterbury as well is known uh, for wearing a hair shirt and sort of disguising it. And in fact, um, there were some jests from some of the other monks and brothers around him that, you know, um, he needed to control his you know, appetite and his passions for his appetite. Uh, but really, that extra bulk was from the hair shirt. Um, so uh, back to St. Hedwig. Um, she married and she was betrothed to uh, a man named Henry uh, for quite some time. Um, and when she finally um, was married to him, it went off uh, pretty well. Um, but eventually Henry was captured and the appeals that she made to her captor uh, always failed. And so her son, which is known as uh, Henry the Pious, had readied an army and he was going to go out and ride and um, go, you know, rescue his father. However, Hedwig didn't want this, you know, bloodshed to happen. So she went out herself to meet um, the jailer of her husband, um, the one who was keeping him captive. And in fact, she, her appeals in person granted the release of her husband. Um, in some time, though, uh, her husband would die. Uh, she was widowed, and she entered the, a convent. And this convent was actually under the daughter of uh, uh, her daughter, Gertrude, who was the head abbess of the convent. Now, St. Hedwig didn't actually receive any orders herself, um, but she always practiced, um, you know, uh, the acts of piety that were um, done in this order of, with the rest of the nuns. Um, her son was killed, unfortunately, and she is quoted as saying, basically, you know, thank God for the gift of him, but she, uh, God took him back into heaven. Um, so even, you know, the most devastating events and traumas in life didn't tear her away from her piety and her love for the Lord. Um, now, St. Hedwig of Silesia is easy to get confused because I did. So I assume it's easy, right? I can't be the only one who get confused. Uh, St. Hedwig of Poland, also known as Jadwiga. Um, and this is who I thought St. Hedwig was when I looked at the calendar, trying to think what saints would be best for this month. Um, and I knew of this particular saint, Jadwiga, um, because of a game, Civilization uh, Six, which is, I, I think, a pretty fun waste of time. Uh, but anyways, there's a one character you can play as, which is um, Hedwig of Poland, Jadwiga. And um, you can see her down here. And uh, she was actually canonized by John Paul II in 1997. And more to the confusion, she was even named after Hedwig of Silesia. And even more confusing, she also reigned in the Kingdom of Poland um, about 100 years after the life of Hedwig of Silesia. So we're going to refer to this St. Hedwig canonized by J.P. II as Jadwiga. Uh, Jadwiga lived through 1373 uh, to 79, or rather she reigned from that time. Her feast is July 17th, and she ascended the throne at the age of 13. And she's considered the first, because she is the first, uh, female monarch of the Kingdom of Poland. Um, now she's considered the patron of queens, and she was also betrothed um, to a pagan husband, uh, much like the wife of St. Clovis. 
Um, but a vision of Jesus on the crucifix uh, told her to marry him, despite him being a pagan and her reservations, you know, her being a good Christian. But this actually was fruitful because it led to the conversion or helped lead to the conversion of Lithuania, um, the people of Lithuania. Um, because once her husband converted, he did all he could to bring along the rest of his nobles and um, the rest of his retinue. Um, and of course, from the top down, the people follow. Now, a sad story about her. She had a daughter um, and she died pretty much as an infant. Um, and Jadwiga also, you know, um, her health deterior deteriorated from this and her spirits, you know, no doubt, um, died soon after. And they were buried next to each other. So she is actually more of a, uh, a royal saint, I suppose, than Silesia, um, being a king, as she was called at the time, uh, taking over for the dead king of Poland, whereas Sili uh, Hedwig of Silesia was a duchess. But um, you could maybe quibble about canonizations by John Paul II. Um, I haven't looked into what, if anything's really questionable about her. Um, she seems to have lived a pretty pious life as well. Um, so that's all I got to say about that. We'll move on to our next kingly saint, um, and this saint will be in my book, Christ Kings, Royal Saints of the Catholic Church, which you can donate to if you go to one of the links below to PayPal, donate, you'll get a holy card, all good stuff. Um, so St. Edward the Confessor is considered one of the last Anglo-Saxon kings. He's not technically the last Anglo-Saxon king, uh, but in terms of piety, um, he is. So uh, St. Edward the Confessor, as he is known, um, was born in 1003, and he reigned from 1042 to 1066. Uh, now, during his lifetime, the Danes under uh, Canute the I had invaded England and conquered it, and, uh, and this was in 1013, so around when Edward was 10 years old. Uh, for the next 25 years, he would be exiled in Normandy. And uh, he would be with his half-brother, Alfred, uh, and his mother. And I think they lived uh, with his uncle in uh, Normandy. Um, his uh, brother and his father would actually go on to be killed. And eventually, Edward himself, which he never really looked towards being a king or um, really was too ambitious in the worldly sense. He uh, was always a fairly religious uh, soul. Uh, he became the next in line for the crown, and the lords made him king, which he accepted. Um, now, Edward, he had always wanted to take a pilgrimage to St. Peter's in Rome. Um, however, leaving your realm, especially in the situation he was facing, you know, with the Danes pressing in, he didn't uh, want to leave, and, you know, leave his people abandoned. Um, so he appealed to the Pope, what should he do? Um, and the Pope at the time actually said, why not bring St. Peter's to yourself? So build it there um, in his own realm. And this is the origins of uh, Westminster Abbey. Um, he didn't build a new foundation necessarily. There was already an existing church, but he added on to it. And now we have Westminster Abbey where he would actually end up being buried and uh, also the kings of, um, of England going forward. Um, I didn't look, but I assume the last king of uh, England was buried there as well. Anyways, um, he's known for, again, not being very ambitious, and the only battle he ever, or outside war he ever partook in, was um, to help Malcolm II of Scotland um, hold on to his throne, and um, that is what um, Shakespeare's Macbeth is about, though um, the historical documentations on Malcolm II and all of that, there's really f not that much detail, um, and even... Um, uh, Macbeth by Shakespeare, you know, took the liberties off of a few lines to create, you know, his masterpiece. Um, so I highly recommend checking that out regardless. Um, now, uh, there was a, um, a tax called the Danegold, which was oppressive to the people of England. And this was instituted uh, by the Dane Canut the first. Um, and this was a Danish tax, um, which the people found really Plorable. And when Edward ascended the throne, he abolished it, along with refusing to institute any new taxes, which basically means he's not funding an army, and which goes back to, you know, his lack of 
going out and um, fighting outside his own borders. He really believed in prayer um, and his faith in God to protect him from the other barbarians and Vikings that were about. He spent his money instead on roads and building churches. And for this reason, the people loved him. You know, imagine a politician abolishing taxes today. You know, he would be a, a populist hero. Um, there was a story about him that uh, his enemy, um, his enemies, the Danes, were coming to invade. Um, and he was at church and he started to laugh. And the lords around him were curious. And they asked him, what, is, what are you doing? Why are you laughing? And he said that he had a vision um, that his enemy, wa um, I can't remember who it was, uh, the leader of the Danes at the time, but he had walked um, and accidentally slipped off a pier into the water and died. And so this kind of abandoned the mission of the Danes to go and invade England. Um, so sort of Edward the Confessor had a sense of a prophecy in a way, um, or a, I don't know, clairvoyance. And um, so... Aside from that, um, the piety of St. Edward, piety of St. Edward. He died in 1066 and was buried at St. Peter's Church in England, which, as we said, is Westminster Abbey. So um, he had a vow of perpetual chastity, um, and he lived chaste with his wife his whole life. Now, modernists and critical historians uh, will claim that, you know, maybe they were uh, sterile or incapable of having children because he never did have an heir. And in the materialist mindset of these sorts of historians, if you really want to call them that, um, you know, his not having an heir was a big detriment and his love for, you know, the church and God and his piety and holy life and prayer was um, not something to so much be looked on as favorable for a king because in those things you could say he neglected uh, building up his army and defending England. And as we would see not too long uh, after uh, his death, uh, the Normans uh, would conquer England um, at the Battle of Hastings, I believe. So usually it's just sort of a downward spiral of blaming um, St. Edward the Confessor for that by these impious historians and scholars. Uh, but as the legends go, um, he had a rep reputation for even healing the sick. And at his tomb, there was a cripple who recovered the use of his legs and a blind man his sight. Um, this helped to lead to his beatification. Of course, in 1102, his body was actually exhumed and found to be incorrupt, and the clothes were still fresh. He was canonized in 1161 by Pope Alexander III, and as I said, buried at Westminster. And interestingly, he was the patron of England until 1415 when he was replaced by St. George. And, I, you know, St. George is a great saint, for sure. Um, but, you know, I don't think we should neglect uh, the patronage of St. Edward the Confessor as the patron of England. Um, and certainly a holy and pious king. All right, now let's get into the, some meat and bones here. Um, we're going to be looking at the institution of the Feast of Christ the King. And um, this was instituted by Pope Pius XI uh, in, in his encyclical, Quas Primus, um, on December 11th, 1925. Um, now, the date of Christ the King has moved on the calendar with the Novus Ordo. I don't know. In ordinary time, it's um, a different day than what it was instituted as initially, uh, which was the last day of October. Uh, which makes sense because then we go into the feast of all saints and all souls. So you even get a sense of the hierarchy, Christ, the King, the saints, you know, the souls, the church militant, I guess you could say the, uh, the saints are the church militant as well in a way. Anyways, I won't get into um, semantics. Um, so um, let's go ahead and look at Christ, the King um, and the institution of it, which um, really will help to give us the lasting benefits and the real blessings of liberty, as Pope Pius IX put in his encyclical, um, which I highly recommend that you read. Um, I'm going to give sort of an abridged version here, um, which still has a lot of content. Um, and the stuff I'm skipping over, I'll kind of tell you what it was. Um, but it's not really long, um, and it's quite beneficial to read once, twice, multiple times. Um, so I highly recommend you check out the encyclical of Pope Pius 
the um, 11th on um, uh, the institution of the Feast of Christ the King, Quas Primus. And it begins in the first encyclical letter, which we addressed at the beginning of our pontificate to the bishops of the universal church, we referred to the chief causes of the difficulties under which mankind was laboring. And we remember saying that these manifold evils in the world were due to the fact that the majority of men had thrust Jesus Christ and his holy law out of their lives, that these had no place either in private affairs or in politics. And we said further that as long as individuals and states refused to submit to the rule of our Savior, there would be no really hopeful prospect of a lasting peace among nations. Men must look for the peace of Christ in the kingdom of Christ, and that we must and that we promised to do as far as lay in our power. In the kingdom of Christ, that is, it seemed to us that peace could not be more effectually restored nor fixed upon a firmer basis than through the restoration of the empire of our Lord. We were led, in the meantime, to indulge the hope of a brighter future at the sight of a more widespread and keener interest evinced in Christ and his church the one source of salvation, a sign that men who had formerly spurned the rule of our Redeemer and had exiled themselves from his kingdom were preparing and even hastening to return to the duty of obedience. Um, next, he goes into some notable events of the past year, and he attributes these to the glory of this feast, which he's going to institute. Continues, uh, we deem it in keeping with our apostolic office to accede to the desire of many of the cardinals, bishops, and faithful made known to us, both individually and collectively, by closing this holy year with the insertion into the sacred liturgy of a special feast of the kingship of our Lord Jesus Christ. This matter is so dear to our heart, venerable brethren, that I would wish to address you a few words concerning it. It will be for you later to explain in a manner suited to the understanding of the faithful that we are about to say what we are about to say concerning the kingship of Christ, so that the annual feast which we shall decree may be attended with much fruit and prudence, beneficial results in the future. Um, next, he goes into um, really the origins of the title, Christ the King, and first he goes into the metaphorical meaning as obviously Christ reigns over our hearts and our intellect. Um, continuing, he says, if we ponder this matter more deeply, we cannot but see that the title and the power of king belongs to Christ as man in the strict and proper sense too. For it is only as man that he may be said to have received from the father power and glory and a kingdom. Since the word of God as, consub as consubstantial with the father has all things in common with him and therefore has necessarily supreme and absolute dominion over all things. And this is a main point. Christ the King has dominions over all things. Um, I myself had quite a bit of confusion um, early on with this concept um, years ago um, about Christ the King. And it's like, okay, well, what is the really domain of the Catholic Church? Is it spiritual? And then what is, I guess, you could say secular or temporal, right? Um how much does the church get involved in banking, so to speak, or enforcing the laws? Um, and eventually I've seen the light of the situation. There's a wonderful book um, that I had recommended to me by a Monsignor uh, Sebastian called uh, The Kingship of Christ the King by Father Fale. I think I'm saying that right. I recommend you check that out. I'll put a link to it below. Um, but it really clears up the subject of really what does it mean? What do we mean Christ the King? Um, so in conjunction with this encyclical, I highly recommend you look at the book um, that I just recommended to you. Uh, now, getting distracted, I'm going to go back into what he was reading here. He said, Christ has dominion over all things. Do we not read throughout scripture? He's going to give some actual scriptural basis for the kingship of Christ. First, in the nuptial hymn, where the future king of Israel is hailed as the most rich and powerful monarch, we read, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a scepter of righteousness. He goes into the prophets as well. First, Isaiah, um, for a child is born to us, and a son is given to us, and the government is upon his shoulders, 
and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, God, the Mighty, the Father of the world to come, the Prince of Peace. His empire shall be multiplied, and there shall be no end of peace. He shall sit upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to establish it and strengthen it with judgment and with justice and henceforth and forever. Uh, next, Jeremiah foretells the just seed that shall rest from the house of David, the son of David, that shall reign as king and shall be wise and shall execute judgment and justice in earth. Daniel who announces the kingdom that the God of heaven shall found, says, That shall never be destroyed, and shall stand forever. And again he says, I beheld, therefore, in the vision of the night, and lo, one like the Son of Man came with the cloud of heaven, and he came even to the Ancient of Days, and they presented him before him, and he gave him power and glory, and a kingdom, and all peoples, tribes, and tongues shall serve him. Another important point, all peoples, tribes, and tongues shall serve Christ the King. So the idea of a secular government or any government that doesn't serve Christ the King is unjust by its very nature. Um, I even go, you know, the secular atheist state is even a step beyond in their complete abject rejection of Christ the King. But really, uh, any secular government has enthroned Satan, you know, as their king, over Christ, because what is secularism but the rights of men? Uh, you can look into how and who really are behind the um, promulgation of those anti-Catholic, anti-Christian ideas, elevating man above God and his rights, which is, you know, our biggest problem as a society um, is recognizing ourselves and our assumed rights, but not looking at the rights of Christ first who has dominion over all. Um, continuing with the prophecies, uh, the prophets um, who attest to the um, title of Christ the King, Zachary, concerning the merciful king riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the fowl of an ass, entering Jerusalem as the just savior amid the acclamations of the multitude. This same doctrine of the kingship of Christ, which we have found in the Old Testament, is even more clearly taught and confirmed in the New. The archangel Gabriel the Lord shall give unto him the throne of David his father, and he shall reign in the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then Christ himself speaks of his own kingly authority. In his last discourse, speaking of the rewards and punishments that will be the eternal lot of the just and the damned, in his reply to the Roman magistrate who asked him publicly whether he were a king or not, after his resurrection, when giving to his apostles the mission of teaching and baptizing all nations, he took the opportunity to call himself king, confirming the title publicly, and solemnly proclaimed that all power was given him in heaven and on earth. What wonder then that he whom St. John calls the prince of the kings of the earth appears in the apostles' vision in the future as he who hath on his garment and on his thigh written, King of kings and Lord of lords. This is, of course, from Revelation. It is, the, it is Christ whom the Father hath appointed heir of all things, for he must reign until, at the end of the world, he hath put all his enemies under the feet of God and the Father. Now, um, besides the biblical justifications, he uses the liturgy in the East and the West and their concordance um, as a justification. Uh, the church uses daily in her language titles of honor, such as King of Kings, in the prayers publicly offered to God, and in offering the Immaculate Viaticum. The communal praise of Christ the King shows the truth of the axiom, Legim credendi lex statuit supplicandi. The rule of faith is indicated by the law of our worship. So our worship which indicates our law. I mean, I'm just repeating what it says. You can figure it out. Um, uh, next, he quotes some of the saints. Um, uh, St. Cyril of Alexandria discusses the nature of meaning of the Lordship of Christ, uh, the obvious spiritual nature of his authority, um, and uh, that's based on uh, you know his saying his kingdom is not of this earth, right? So he's he has a spiritual um, aspect of his authority. 
But uh, the encyclical goes on, it would be a grave error, on the other hand, to say that Christ has no authority whatsoever in civil affairs, since by virtue of the absolute empire over all creatures committed to him by the Father, all things are in his power. Nevertheless, during his life on earth, he refrained from the exercise of such authority, and although he himself disdained to possess or to care for earthly goods, he did not, nor does he today, interfere with those who possess them. Thus, the empire of our Redeemer embraces all men. To use the words of our immortal predecessor, Pope Leo XIII, his empire includes not only Catholic nations, not only baptized persons, who, though of right of belonging to the church, have been led astray by error or have been cut off from her schism, but also all those who are outside the church and Christian faith, so that truly the whole of mankind is subject to the power of Jesus Christ. Nor is there any difference in this matter between the individual and the family or the state, for all men, whether collectively or individually, are under the dominion of Christ. In him, it is the salvation of the individual. Um, just to take a little uh, aside here, um, whether collectively or individually, uh, we're all under the dominion of Christ. The Catholic Church didn't initially set out to take the reins of government. Um, in fact, historically, if you look at it, um, really the responsibilities of caring for the people were thrust upon the shoulders of the church because they were what was standing in between, you know, um, civilized society and the collapse of the Roman Empire and the barbarian invasions and paganism and heresy. Um, you know, that's just a side there. Um, we're going to continue. So, uh, um, yeah, the dominion of Christ, um, it wasn't something that was just, uh, taken out of greed. It was something that fell upon the shoulders, almost divine, uh, from God. Unfortunately, a lot of, uh, bad popes, you could say, and bishops and priests and, uh, bad kings ended up, uh, leading to the dismantlement of the kingship of Christ, um, but the kingship of Christ itself has never really um, been instituted in its full. You've had some kings here and there adopting Christianity, um, a lot of them coming from a pagan background. So to the extent that they could have a full or perfect sort of conversion and be a glorious Catholic king, you know, maybe questionable. And um, the fact that some of their uh, followers and nobles would sort of convert on account of the head of state, you know, changing their religion. Um, but I mean, along with that goes the fact that you need a strong Catholic state. Otherwise you have absolute and complete chaos, which is what this encyclical is getting at. Uh, we're going to continue in, um, in the individual in him is the salvation of society. Neither is there salvation in any other for there is no other name under heaven given to men whereby we must be saved. He, Jesus Christ, is the author of happiness and true prosperity for every man and for every nation. For a nation is happy when its citizens are happy. What else is a nation but a number of men living in concord? If, therefore, the rulers of nations wish to preserve their authority, to promote and increase the prosperity of their countries, they will not neglect the public duty of reverence and obedience to the rule of Christ. What we said at the beginning of our pontificate concerning the decline of public authority and the lack of respect for the same is equally true at the present day. With God and Jesus Christ, we said, excluded from political life, with authority derived not from God but from man, the very basis of that authority has been taken away because the chief reason of the distinction between ruler and subject has been eliminated. The result is that human society is tottering to its fall because it has no longer a secure and solid foundation. When once men recognized both in private and in public life that Christ is king, society will at last receive the great blessings of real liberty, well-ordered discipline, peace, and harmony. Our Lord's regal office invests the human authority of princes and rulers with a religious significance it, en it ennobles the citizen's duty of obedience. So if you don't have a truly Catholic king, how can you expect a citizen to be obedient to one that is so flagrant? 
Continuing, if princes and magistrates duly elected are filled with the persuasion that they rule not by their own right, but by the mandate and in the place of the divine king, they will exercise their authority piously and wisely, and they will make laws and administer them, having in view the common good and also the human dignity of their subjects. The result will be a stable peace and tranquility, for there will no longer be any cause of discontent. Men will see in their king or in their rulers men like themselves, perhaps unworthy or open to criticism, but they will not on that account refuse obedience if they see reflected in them the authority of Christ God and man. Peace and harmony too will result, for with the spread and the universal extent of the kingdom of Christ, men will become more and more conscious of the link that binds them together, and thus many conflicts will be either prevented entirely or at least their bitterness will be diminished. So now uh, one of the important parts, I mean, it's all important. One of the interesting, extra interesting parts, um, he goes into why institute a feast to begin with. He says <clears throat> that God's blessings may be abundant and lasting in Christian society. It is necessary that the kingship of our savior should be as widely as possible recognized and understood and to the and to that end. Nothing would serve better than the institution of a special feast in honor of the kingship of Christ. For people are instructed in the truths of faith and brought to appreciate the inner joys of religion far more effectually by the annual celebration of our sacred mysteries than by any official pronouncement of the teaching of the church. Such pronouncements usually reach only a few, and the more learned among the faithful feasts reach them all. The former speak but once, the latter speak every year, in fact, forever. The church, the church's teaching affects the mind primarily. Her feasts affect both mind and heart and have a salutary, salutary effect upon the whole of man's nature. Man is composed of body and soul, and he needs these external festivities so that the sacred rites and all their beauty and variety may stimulate him to drink more deeply of the fountain of God's teaching, that he may make it part of himself and use it with profit for his spiritual life. History, in fact, tells us that in the course of ages, these festivities have been instituted one after another according as the needs or the advantage of the people of Christ seemed to demand, as when they needed strength to face a common danger, when they were attacked by insidious heresies, when they needed to be urged to the pious consideration of some mystery of faith or of some divine blessing. Thus, in the earliest days of the Christian era, when the people of Christ were suffering cruel persecution, the cult of the martyrs was begun in order, says St. Augustine, that the feasts of the martyrs might incite men to martyrdom. The liturgy honors paid to confessors virgins and widows produced wonderful results in an increased zest for virtue necessary even in times of peace. But more fruitful still were the feast instituted in the honor of the Blessed Virgin. As a result of these, men grew not only in their devotion to the Mother of God as an ever-present advocate, but also in their love of her as a mother bequeathed to them by their Redeemer. Take that, Protestants. Recent festivities or festivals. The festivals that have been introduced into the liturgy in more recent years have had a similar origin and have been attended with similar results. The reverence and devotion to the Blessed Sacrament had grown cold. The Corpus, the Feast of Corpus Christi was instituted so that by means of solemn processions, the prayer of eight days duration, men might be brought once more to render public homage to Christ. So, too, the feast of the sacred heart of Jesus was instituted at a time when men were oppressed by the sad and gloomy severity of Jansenism, which had made their hearts grow cold and shut them out from the love of God and the hope of salvation. More ills of the day, he talks about. If we ordain that the whole Catholic world shall revere Christ as king, we shall minister to the need of the present day and, at the same time, provide an excellent remedy for the plague which now infects society. 
we refer to the plague of anti-clericalism, its errors and impious activities. This evil spirit, as you are well aware, venerable brethren, has not come into being in one day. It has long lurked beneath the surface. The empire of Christ over all nations was rejected. The right which the church has from Christ himself to teach mankind, to make laws, to govern peoples in all that pertains to their eternal salvation, that right was denied. Then gradually the religion of Christ came to be likened to false religions and to be placed anonymously on the same level with them. It was then put under the power of the state and tolerated more or less at the whim of princes and rulers. Some men went further and wished to set up in the place of God's religion, a natural religion consisting in some instinctive affection of the heart. There were even some nations who thought they could dispense with God, and that their religion should consist in impiety and the neglect of God. The rebellion of individuals and states against the authority of Christ has produced deplorable consequences. We lament these in the encyclical Ubi Arcano. We lament them today. The seeds of discord sown far and wide, those bitter enmities and rivalries between nations, which still hinder so much the cause of peace, that insatiable greed which is so often hidden under a pretense of public spirit and patriotism, and gives rise to so many private quarrels, a blind and immoderate selfishness, making men seek nothing but their own comfort and advantage, and measure everything by these, no peace in the home, because men have forgotten or neglected their duty, the unity and stability of the family undermined, society in a word shaken to its foundations, and on the way to ruin. I think that's a really wonderful screed <laughs> uh, by the Pope, uh, by Pope Pius XI here. Uh, continuing, we firmly hope, however, that the feast of the kingship of Christ, which in future will be yearly observed, may hasten the return of society to our loving Savior. It would be the duty of Catholics to do all they can to to do all they can to bring about this happy result. Many of these, however, have neither the station in society nor the authority which should belong to those who bear the torch of truth. This state of things may perhaps be attributed to a certain slowness and timidity in good people, who are reluctant to engage in conflict or oppose, but a weak resistance. Thus, the enemies of the church become bolder in their attacks. But if the faithful were generally to understand that it behooves them ever to fight courageously under the banner of Christ the King, then their fire with then fired with apost then fired with apostolic zeal they would strive to win over to their lord those hearts that are bitter and estranged from him and would that are bitter and estranged from him and would valiantly defend his rights moreover the annual and universal celebration of the feast of the kingship of christ will draw attention to the evils which anti-clericalism has brought upon society in drawing men away from Christ, and will also do much to remedy them while nations insult the beloved name of a Redeemer by suppressing all mention of it in their conferences and parliaments. We must all the more loudly proclaim his kingly dignity and power, all the more universally affirm his rights. And I'm going to stop there. There's more uh, after that. Uh, which is edifying to read. And I read so much of it already um, just because I couldn't put it in any better words. Uh, really, Quas Primus is an excellent encyclical, well worth reading multiple times. Listen to, you know, an audio recording of it. I did that in preparation for this as well. Um, and I, it, another interesting thing I think to mention is the trouble of anti-clericalism that he mentions um, and then you have the modernist Francis today talking about the problem of clericalism. So really the juxtaposition between these two pontiffs and really uh, any clear reading of this encyclical will make it obvious to a Catholic anyways or a Christian that enshrining Christ as king is essential. And um, I apologize for the 
lighting situation going so dark. Um, but, you know, it is October, and I started uh, around like 6 o'clock, so the sun has gone down. So this is the spooky end of um, our October Saints uh, history lesson here. Um, so what is our real takeaway um, from Quas Primus? It is that we shouldn't be considering our own rights. We should be considering the rights of Christ the King before all. Um, if there's any way that we're going to trip and fall in our own pride and sin, it is by considering, well, what do I think is the right of man or uh, should I be able to do versus, well, what is God's right? Um, and anecdotally, I had a, you know, little exchange with, I believe, a Protestant on, you know, Gab, and they were like, well, abortion, I think it's not that good, but it's acceptable in, you know, certain circumstances where a mother's going to die. But I took the position that, no, it's never acceptable to, you know, murder an infant life, you know, aside from the fact that the statistical um, situation in which the mother's life is actually threatened and they have to kill the child is, you know, COVID numbers ridiculous um, in terms of being a big farce. Um, and so really this person was considering the rights of, you know, the mother. Well, the mother should have the right to do this. Why does the baby have the right over it? And he was looking at it all wrong. Um, in fact, Christ has the right. And this guy went as far as to say, well, you know, God kills people. So, you know, uh, that crazy sort of atheistic logic that God kills people. But, you know, other than it being theologically false that God kills people, God certainly allows sin and sin is the, uh, the wages of death. So, you know, the consequences of uh, concupiscence. Um, so anyways, I'm getting off on a tangent here. I'm going to go ahead and end with just saying that we should, like this guy should have, put the rights of Christ the King, who is the author of life to begin with. So he has the right to give and take away, whereas man doesn't have the right to give and take away a life and abortion, um, period. You know, and the, the fact that society has gotten so far away from recognizing Christ and his rights um, is why we're in the state that we're in. So I recommend reading this encyclical, Quas Primus by Pope Pius XI, as well as Father Dennis Fahey's uh, The Social Rights of Jesus Christ the King. It's a great addendum to that. So I want to thank you all for listening today. Um, like and subscribe, follow on social media, VRP Catholic Media. Look on BitChute, on Gab, on Rumble, on Instagram, on all that dumb stuff. Um, uh, yeah, I got a presence there. I'm trying to build it up to reach more people because there's plenty of Catholics that need to be um, motivated in the faith, have their morale boosted, and hopefully I can really sharpen the tools that they need to fight against the modernism and those that detract from the faith and from God. You know, you'll know how to respond even to some of their inane historical arguments that make no sense. Anyways, um, this is VRP Catholic Media. Thanks for watching and God bless.